guys! Today we are going to talk about chapter 13, which is the endocrine system, but I've divided it up into two parts because there are a lot of hormones and endocrine glands that you guys need to know. First and probably most important is the fact that there are two major types of glands, exocrine glands and endocrine glands. Exocrine glands think exo-external, so they secrete their products externally. They use ducts and tubes to get their product to the body surface. So they're going to go directly to a specific site. So think of digestive juices and things that you wouldn't want out of the tube are being carried in the exocrine glands. Endocrine glands are the ones we're going to talk about right now because these are the glands, tissues, and organs that make up the endocrine system. They do not have ducts like the exocrine glands. They secrete their product directly into the bloodstream. Their products are hormones, and hormones are the molecules that are secreted into the bloodstream, and they're going to act on a specific target cell. Now, there's lock and key specificity here, so a hormone is going to bind to its receptor, and that's the only thing that it's going to bind to. Endo means internal secretion. There are also glands that secrete messenger molecules. These include paracrine secretions and autocrine secretions. Paracrine secretions are secretions that are going to affect a nearby cell, so they don't travel long distances. Autocrine secretions are even shorter. They affect that same cell. So whatever cell secreted it, that's the cell that's going to be affected. So just to summarize, autocrine secretions affect the cell that secretes it. Paracrine secretions are going to travel short distances. And endocrine secretions are going to travel long distances. This is just showing you the thyroid gland, one example of an endocrine gland. And it secretes its hormones directly into the body fluids whereas exocrine glands, like the sweat glands in the skin, secrete substances through a duct into the body surface. Two systems that run our body, the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system releases what are called neurotransmitters into synapses. Should have learned about that last semester. The endocrine system secretes hormones into the bloodstream. Now, both systems communicate using these chemicals but, as I said, the nervous system are neurotransmitters, endocrine are hormones. So they both function in communication. Very importantly, the nervous system is the one that's really in charge. The nervous system is the first responder. It's the first one to react, and then it's going to bring about an effect. But the effect is short-lived. The endocrine system, on the other hand, is slower to react, but its effects are longer lasting. Now, the nervous system can always, always, always override the endocrine system at any point in time because the nervous system is what's really in charge. And there's just a chart comparing the nervous system with the endocrine system. And remember, you should be paying attention to anything in blue or red because that means it's going to be important for your midterm and final. So as I said, the endocrine system is precise. It targets the cells that the hormones are going to bind to, but it's much slower than the nervous system and has longer lasting effects. The target cells have the receptors for the hormone, so no other cells are going to be impacted. The major endocrine glands, as you can see from the picture, actually run along the midline of the body. The hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, adrenal, and pancreas are some of them that we're going to talk about. And then there's other small groups of cells that also have endocrine secretions that we'll talk about later on. The hormones are released into the extracellular spaces that surround the endocrine cells, and then they're going to diffuse into the bloodstream for distribution. Here's a chart showing you the source of the hormone, the hormone itself, the abbreviation, and what else it's called. Make sure that you know the name and the abbreviation because you could be given the abbreviation sometimes, you could be given the hormone sometimes. And yes, we're going to go through all of these. Here's page two. First things first, it's important to know how hormones act. How do they bring about these changes? 
So there's two types. We have steroid or steroid-like hormones, and we have non-steroid hormones. The steroids are lipids containing the four carbon ring and hydrogen atoms. All steroid hormones are produced from cholesterol. Some examples, you got testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, and aldosterone. Non-steroid hormones can be amines that are derived from tyrosine, like epinephrine or epinephrine, proteins that are composed of long chains of amino acids, like growth hormone, peptides, which are short chains of amino acids, like oxytocin, or glycoproteins, which are carbohydrates joined to proteins, like thyroid-stimulating hormone. Here's a chart showing you the type of compound, how they're formed, and some examples. And then this is just showing you the structure of the different hormones so you can get an idea of what they look like. So hormones exert their effects by changing the metabolic processes. They can change enzyme activity or the rate of membrane transport of a particular substance. They deliver their messages, remember, by binding to the receptors on the target cells. Hormones can then affect changes in the target cells, even if we do not have a lot of the hormone. The number of receptors is going to determine the strength of the response and actually can be changed to alter the response. Upregulation is an increase in the number of receptors in response to a decrease in hormone level. Downregulation is the opposite. It's a decrease in the number of receptors because of an increase in the hormone level. Steroid and thyroid hormones both have poor water solubility. But this means that they can diffuse right through the lipid bilayer of the cell membranes. So this is an important factor in how they act. Thyroid hormones are thought to enter the cell by specific transport methods, but very importantly, they bind to the receptors inside the cell, usually right in the nucleus. So what's going to happen is the steroid and thyroid hormone are going to diffuse right through the lipid bilayer, go straight to the nucleus, enter through the nuclear pore, and bind to the receptors inside the nucleus. Then they're going to bring about their change. It could be transcribing a gene or whatever the message is supposed to be. And there's a chart, there's a chart saying these effects right there. This is a picture showing you. So the hormone's going to diffuse right through the cell membrane, enter through the nuclear pore, bind to the receptors in the nucleus. And in this particular case, it's going to transcribe a gene which is then going to be translated and bring about whatever cellular change is necessary. Non-steroid hormones, on the other hand, can't go right through the lipid membrane. So they have to bind to the receptors on the target membrane first. This is known as the first messenger. So the hormone is the first messenger. Then a chemical is going to induce the changes leading to the hormone's effect. That chemical is called the second messenger. Many hormones use cyclic AMP as their second messenger. The whole process is called signal transduction. So non-steroid hormones cannot go right through the membrane. They have to use a second messenger. And there are the steps right there. Here's a picture showing you. So the hormone's going to bind to the receptor on the membrane. It's going to activate cyclic AMP, which is then going to cause a cascade of protein kinases, which will eventually bring about the cellular change necessary. Abusing hormones can actually lead to improved athletic performance. However, it also has downsides. Steroids can be used to increase muscular strength. However, it can decrease natural testosterone, stunt growth, cause male sexual characteristics in females, damage our organs, and cause psychiatric problems. They're trying to do many studies linking aggression to steroids as well. Growth hormone is used to enlarge muscles. It can be used with or along, instead of or along with steroids. And then erythropoietine is the hormone that signals red blood cell production. So this is going to be used to increase the number of red blood cells. Now our red blood cells carry oxygen. So the more red blood cells you have, the better oxygen delivery you're going to have to the muscles. So some athletes will inject erythropoietine to increase the number of red blood cells and increase the oxygen delivery so that they can run longer in marathons and improve their performance overall. 
It's also used to treat forms of an anemia sometimes. However, it can lead to heart attack and death, so it's not recommended. You may have also heard of blood doping. Blood doping happens when an athlete will take blood out of their system. Now our body is going to naturally replace that blood, replacing the red blood cells. And then right before a race, the athlete will re-inject their blood back into them. Well, now that's going to increase their oxygen carrying capability, which is going to increase their endurance, but it also just increased their blood volume. So that can cause problems down the line as well. Prostaglandins are paracrine substances. They're very small amounts that are very potent. So they're not stored in cells, they're synthesized before they're released, and they're rapidly inactivated after we're done with them. They regulate cellular responses to hormones because they can activate or inhibit adenylate cyclase. That in turn is going to control cyclic AMP production, which is going to alter the cell's response. There's a variety of effects such as contracting or relaxing smooth muscle, inhibiting or stimulating secretions, regulating blood pressure. We're going to talk more about these in the chapter on immunity. Hormone secretion is primarily negative feedback. We know that most of everything in our body is controlled by negative feedback. Again, hormones can be short-lived or last for days. So these secretions have to be precisely regulated. They can be excreted in the urine after we're done with them, or they can be broken down by enzymes to stop their effects. A small number are controlled by positive feedback. These are usually the reproductive tract. Negative feedback has three ways, tropic hormones, nervous system control, or changes in the composition of the internal environment. Tropic hormones are hormones that one endocrine gland secretes that regulate another endocrine gland and we'll talk about those shortly. The nervous system can't directly stimulate some glands to secrete their hormones through nerve impulses, or receptors can pick up that something has changed in our blood, like glucose concentration, for example, and then it can stimulate or inhibit certain secretions of certain hormones. This is just showing you how it's done. So tropic hormones are first, so you have the hypothalamus, regulating the anterior pituitary, nervous system control, directly stimulating endocrine glands, or changes in the internal environment. Again, it's mainly under negative feedback, so this is a picture that you should be very familiar with. If something changes, so hormone levels are too high or too low, they're going to be brought back down or back up to their normal levels. Our hormone concentration is basically leveled out so that we have a little bit sometimes, a little less sometimes, so it's kind of wavy, but on average, it's pretty stable. The pituitary gland is at the base of the brain in the cella turcica of the sphenoid bone, and it's attached to the hypothalamus by the pituitary stalk, which is also called the infundibulum. There are two portions, the anterior and posterior. The anterior lobe is also called the adenohypophysis. The posterior is also called the neurohypophysis. This should kind of give you a clue as to what they are. Adeno is glandular. So the adenohypophysis is made of glandular tissue. Neuro is neural. So the neurohypophysis is neural tissue. Again, it's directly connected to the hypothalamus. So secretion of these lobes is going to be controlled by the hypothalamus. So hypothalamic releasing hormones are going to be transported through the hypophysial portal system to stimulate the cells of the anterior lobe to release hormones. Nerve impulses from the hypothalamus will travel through the infundibulum and stimulate the nerve endings in the posterior lobe to release hormones. So this is just showing you how we can control peripheral endocrine glands from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus does a lot of stuff. So the hypothalamus is also an endocrine gland. It's going to control hormone secretion by either releasing a hypothalamic releasing hormone. It's going to cause the anterior pituitary to release whatever hormone it is. And then the anterior pituitary is going to act on another endocrine gland because of its hormone secretion. And again, there's multiple negative feedback mechanisms happening. 
So again, the anterior lobe is glandular tissue. It secretes hormones through five types of secretory cells, but we really care about the hormones. Growth hormone, prolactin, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone are the six hormones it releases and synthesizes. So this is just showing you the big picture. The top row are the hormones from the hypothalamus, the middle row are from the anterior pituitary, and the bottom are the target cells. So the hypothalamus will release growth hormone releasing hormone. That's going to stimulate the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone, which will then act on the bone, muscle, and adipose tissue. The hypothalamus can also release somatostatin, which will inhibit the anterior pituitary from releasing growth hormone. Prolactin releasing factor from the hypothalamus will stimulate the anterior pituitary to release prolactin, which will then act on the mammary glands. Prolactin inhibiting hormone from the hypothalamus will inhibit prolactin release and inhibit the mammary glands. Thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus is going to stimulate the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which will act on the thyroid. Corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus will stimulate the anterior pituitary to release adrenocorticotropic hormone, which will then act on the adrenal gland, stimulating it. Gonadotropin releasing hormone will stimulate the anterior pituitary to release both luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, which act on the ovaries and testes. So growth hormone is going to stimulate the cells to enlarge and divide rapidly. It's going to increase protein synthesis, decrease carbohydrate usage, increase rate of fat usage, and also increase the amino acid uptake, which is important, of course, for protein synthesis. Prolactin promotes milk production in females. Thyroid stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the secretion of thyroid hormones from the thyroid. And we'll talk about more about that later on. Adrenocorticotropic hormone is going to stimulate secretion of cortisol and other glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex, and we'll talk about that later as well. And then follicle-stimulating hormone causes growth and development of the ovarian follicles in females and sperm production in males. Luteinizing hormone causes ovulation in females and sex hormone production in both genders. Thyroid stimulating hormone is going to be controlled in one of two ways. Thyroid stimulating hormone secretion will be controlled by some extent from the hypothalamus releasing thyrotropin releasing hormone. It's also going to be controlled by the level of thyroid hormones in the body. Hypopituitary dwarfism is caused by a deficiency of growth hormone during childhood. You have a short stature, but the body proportions and mental development are normal. Treatment for this has to start before the bones completely ossify. So it has to be started very early on to have any effect at all. Gigantism is caused by oversecretion of growth hormone during childhood. Height can exceed eight feet, but they're also going to have other metabolic problems. And this can often be caused by a pituitary tumor. Acromegaly is caused by oversecretion of growth hormone during adulthood. This is after that epiphyseal ossification has occurred. So the epiphyseal plane in our long bones, they've closed. You're not going to have an increase in height, but the bones are going to start to thicken and other organs and parts of the body are going to start to enlarge. The posterior pituitary does not make any hormones itself. The hypothalamus produces antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin and then sends it to the posterior pituitary for storage and release. They're transported through the infundibulum. Antidiuretic hormone is also known as vasopressin. This decreases urine production by reducing the water volume of the kidney's excretion. It also causes vasoconstriction to increase blood pressure. So basically, we're going to conserve water with antidiuretic hormone. Oxytocin causes muscle contractions in the uterine walls during childbirth and also milk ejection during lactation. So oxytocin is one of those ones that's released and causes those uterine contractions. And the more oxytocin is released, the stronger the uterine contractions get. 
So that's one of the few positive feedback mechanisms that we talked about. This is just summarizing the hormones that we've already talked about. So the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. It's important to know that the hypothalamus controls the pituitary. So the hypothalamus is going to release whatever releasing hormone is necessary to have the anterior pituitary release the actual hormone itself. So for example, the thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus is going to have the, post, the anterior pituitary release thyroid stimulating hormone, which will then target the thyroid. However, if there's enough thyroid gland, or sorry, if there's enough thyroid hormone in the body circulating, we don't need thyroid stimulating hormone, so it'll be inhibited. So that's the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus control of the pituitary gland. We are going to talk about the rest of the hormones and the rest of the endocrine glands in the second part of this lecture.